It's a beautiful day today. It's extraordinarily beautiful. I went running around the meadows this morning and admired it all. In 1979, you were a student. I was. Now your position is totally different. This is like a second chance. You know, when you were a student, it passed in a blur and I did love it. And I just thought, right, that's the end of my Oxford days. And then suddenly I'm offered this gift, come back and do this whole new thing without some of the stresses that, uh, you know, as a student you put up with. So it's been a real joy, actually. Yeah. Positive mind, positive thinking. That's great. Start. That's me. What inspired you to accept the post of University College's first ever visitor in the creative arts? I'd already been doing uh, some work with the master to promote humanities across the uh, alumni community. He had this initiative called UNIF in the Arts. We put it together ourselves. And I've been putting on events in London with poets and screenwriters and fiction writers. And our conversation led to the idea that maybe we could offer something similar to the students themselves. And he came up with the idea of me being, I suppose, an artist in residence, but not just to sit there working on my latest novel. I found it rather hard to work on my latest novel. I've been too busy. Um, but to just open up avenues of discussion with the students about things like creativity and poetry and literature and art and why it matters and where we're going. And what I offer is a contrast to their very um, pressurised academic studies. So I'm like just the extra fun, the icing on the cake. And I entice them into my events with fun titles and food and a bit of drink. And uh, we. I will talk for a bit or somebody, a visitor that I've invited will talk for a bit. And then we have wonderful conversations that quite often I'm asking them to leave, you know, because they've, they've stayed so long. Because you can't talk about art, literature, creativity without talking about life. So they're kind of, there is a kind of sort of pastoral aspect to where they feel able, I think and hope, to relax with me and open up about, you know, things that matter to them in a more personal way. Are you saying that uh, students uh, I mean, in the middle of talking about creative arts, do you think uh, they are open-minded to talk about their life as well? It's actually subtler than that. So if you're talking about why you'd want to write something, then a student might say, well, I've got an idea. And then you discuss the idea. And in the process of discussing it, I mean, I have this, I've had this all my life as a novelist. People want to know where your ideas come from. And you realise your experiences infuse your ideas. It's not a question of sort of plucking experiences and bunging them in a book, but they do infuse what you want to write about. So who you are is integral to how you want to express yourself artistically. So it's not, I'm not talking about therapy sessions where we say, you know, it's not like that. But then we'll have big debates about, I had an event on what book, made you want to burn it, it was so horrible. And what book would you just keep close to your heart if the world was going to hell in a handbasket? And so you then talk about why you love and hate books. And of course, one of the books somebody loved was one of the books somebody hated the most. I got them to put all these names of books in a hat. So you'd have brilliant uh, debates about why something works, why it doesn't, and why it works for different people. Uh, and so just getting them, I think, just to, to accept all these different views and that it's such a subjective thing as well and to be very accepting of um, why people might feel really differently. I can see that I mean through your interaction with the young students you may have recalled yourself <laughs> you know as a student a long time ago you know from the year 1979. Anything you would like to share with us? Well, I mean, I know that when I was a student, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I mean, this is something I say to them. So I speak about my life and my choices and I've written novels and I've been a journalist and I've written a memoir as if it was, I knew what I was doing. But that haphazard nature, and particularly when you're 18, 19, 20, and you haven't a clue. And so I, I've been trying to say to them, it, that doesn't matter and that's normal. We're all feeling our way along. It's one of the luxuries of being asked to talk about my work is that you look back and you say, well, yes, of course, you know, I always loved novels and I was always going to be a novelist and, and I cut my teeth on journalism. And you can make a narrative, you can make sense of your life that at the time of living is not there, it's haphazard. 
Um, so I hope that makes them feel a bit more comfortable in, in their own um, confusions. Uh, they're, very, they're also a very supportive group of students in a way I think um, I look back and I think did I have that strong a friendship group? I had a couple of good friends but certainly in UNIF they do offer each other a lot of support through these issues anyway. They're very good at that, they look out for each other. Mm. I think at Oxford University college system helps, the, the closeness college, yes. between tutors yes. and students. I mean that's something I have been aware of with fresh eyes this time around is the wonderful home that a college is. So it provides you with everything, it's there, but you can be in your room and you can be intensely concentrating as you need to do, but then you step outside and there are people to talk to and there's food to eat and there's warmth and there's friendship. Mm. It's like living in a beehive except with a communal place for meeting. And I, I see with slightly wiser eyes the power of that in terms of the support it gives you that as a student you take for granted. I mean, you're herring between rehearsals and music practice and essay crises. But I can see now the way the system works and how the college nurtures its students. Obviously you are using lots of metaphors. Do you think young, young people uh, also use a lot of metaphors in the middle of a conversation with you? It's funny you notice that. I, I wonder if that's the novelist in me. They seem to like what I say. I suspect they don't use as many metaphors. Now I'm thinking about how they answer me. But a good metaphor is, is, is a gem, isn't it? I, I don't know if I'm using good ones, but um, it can really encapsulate what you mean and bring a, an idea you're trying to make to life. So, yeah, I like a good metaphor. In order to use uh, rich metaphors, they need to live longer, I think. <laughs> or more, they need to um, have more experiences. How have your roles in journalism and advertising mixed with your study in literature and novel writing? Well, that is an interesting question because I certainly didn't leave Oxford with a burning desire to be a novelist. I, I loved literature. I was kind of satiated with reading and trying to be clever about, about writers. So I almost needed a break from it. I also needed to pay a rent, earn money. I was of an era where my parents would have been frankly astonished if I'd arrived home and said, well, you know, where, you know, where am I sleeping? I mean, I did have a bedroom, but they were expecting me to have a job. So I went into advertising because it offered a, a solid career and with a good prospect and it looked like fun. And I was only in advertising for three years and then my then husband and I went to live in Buenos Aires. Such an interesting place. I thought, wow, I could reinvent myself as a freelance journalist. That sounds like fun. And there were various issues with me having a proper job there anyway, which I won't go into. So I thought I'd be a journalist. And while I was being a journalist with some success, I would file stories with various newspapers and magazines back in the UK. And I wrote for the Buenos Aires Herald. I decided just to write a short story, just to, out of my own curiosity, really. And I'd become, I'd got back into my avid reading ways by then. And the short story somehow evolved into a longer story once I'd set it in motion. And, and then this became a completed novel. And then it was very easily, to my good fortune, published. And it was well received. And I realised I'd found my thing. And I realised that I wasn't a very good journalist, really. I was too verbose and I was always more interested in the story behind the story. Being a novelist gave me the chance to use all my strength. What I would say about all those experiences, though, is that advertising gave me a really good grounding in sort of normal life and jobs. And I think it's a bit like career politicians. If all you've ever been is a politician, you've never actually been in the world doing stuff. I think it limits your perspective. And some writers who've just always written can only write about writers. You get very kind of in your own ivory tower. And so I think it kept my, my head uh, sort of screwed on pretty firmly in terms of what the wheel was about. And then of course the disciplines in being in advertising, I was an account manager and being a journalist, the self-discipline of writing, having to structure your ideas, having to have deadlines, to recognize it as a business. You know, it's not just sitting there waiting for the muse to float in through an open window and it's all done. You, I think it gave me the ability and the recognition that working hard was what it was about. So um, I am very grateful for those 
years. And I still do some journalism. I mean, it's the way you promote novels these days is they want you to write a piece and then at the end you say, oh, and I've just published a book. So I keep my hand in. Yeah. Many novelists tend to write their novels based on true story. Dostoevsky uh, suffered from epilepsy and uh, in his novel he talked quite a lot about epilepsy. Is it common for novelists, for writers, to think of their true story, their life story in the middle of writing novels? I'm curious. I, I love this question because it, I've just written a, a memoir. So I have just written, I have just given in to the thing that people think novelists give in to all the time, which is to write about yourself. Mm. I can't speak for other novelists, but the way the process works for me is I will create a story that is purely, I have made this story up. I will choose areas that I know I'm familiar with or interested in. I, I use sort of states of being that people are in, moments in their life. I like to look at characters under pressure and where that takes them. I don't pre-plan my books very much. So I feel my way along with my stories, character driven. And what will happen, the way my own experiences will come to play, is that a bit like when an actor, you hear actors talk about tapping into grief or tapping into, they can draw on feelings that are authentic, they're their feelings, but they're using them to be Antigone in uh, Henri Zontigon. Or, so it's, you're, not, you're not putting yourself and your own experience on the stage, you're tapping into the emotions that were true to you. And I think that's something, when it works for me, and it's, it doesn't, it's not something that arrives easily, it comes through a lot of sweat. Um, you just know. So I, I had a, a novel I wrote where a little child got killed. And I wanted, I wanted this to be a powerful, powerful thing in the book. And I was able to draw on experiences I'd had of, of a similar sort of loss many years before. And I was aware I was doing it, but you've got to stay in control of it. it it's not as if you can just gush, you know, it was so terrible and I cried. And you, so it is a bit like what Wordsworth talked about, emotion recollected in tranquility. And so you're in charge but you're drawing on something that was real and you're controlling it. Mm. But, and you know, you know when those moments come. Mm. So that is, a, to me, a really big distinction between saying, that happened to me, I'm going to write about it. It's different. You know, at the end of a um, film, normally, uh, when I see just the one sentence based on true story or something like that, mm. you know, that uh, makes me help to remember longer. That, yes, that's such an interesting one because I do think, and I can speak as a reader myself, I think there's a, there's a genuine curiosity on the part of a reader to feel they're getting something true. Mm -hmm. To call it voyeuristic is probably a bit intense, but I know that people who know me, they're slightly more intrigued to read my books because they think they're going to get an insight into me. And and if you do tempt readers or a cinema audience with based on a true story, this is, this is real life, in inverted commas, this is real life, it gives it a, an appeal that is slightly stronger. Yeah. I, exactly. I, mean, I, I yeah. do think that stronger. is... Stronger. Yes. Yeah. I think that's slightly to undermine the power of art, actually. Oh. Yeah. But that's perhaps a debate <laughs> for another day. No, I... I I get annoyed sometimes with based on a true story or, or historical fiction where you know they've stretched the facts. Now, maybe I'm a very sad, literal-minded person, but I kind of think, could you tell me which facts you've made up? You know, which facts you've made up? If it's based on truth, which is true? What's true? I, I, I'm, I find myself, uh, yes, wanting to know that sometimes, particularly with historical stuff. I don't feel I can trust this story if it's taking me down avenues that might be completely fictional, but it's pretending to be true. But I, I have always thought that even non-fiction is kind of art, don't you think? Oh, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah. And in my work with, on the UNIF in the Arts, I mean, we are covering the humanities, and we did a wonderful event on the writing of history and had two uh, UNIF historians, one of whom actually was a screenplay writer as well, and we had a fascinating debate on the boundaries between fact and fiction. And what is fact? I mean, any historian is still doing a take. They're doing it through the prism of their own interpretive mind. And that, 
however objective you are, it's not cut and dried. Um, and there's, you know, very similar skills and the importance of trying to understand our past. I mean, it's all art, yes. I wouldn't deny that for a moment. There is a huge difference between um, journalistic writing and uh, novelist yes. writing. I get the journalistic writing is centered on facts. Actually, I did a talk about this last week with a student. So as I was thinking what to say, having done a bit of journalism as well, I would say two things. Yes, they are really different. And one of the reasons, I used to try and write for The Spectator magazine and the then editor, Charles Moore, said to me, because I very rarely got anything published, he said, I think you'd be good at writing fiction because I was creating too many stories. But what I also decided when I thought about it was that journalism now uses narratives and stories in a much bigger way. It's always about the emotional story. Storytelling. Story. Yes. So when you've got the Syrian refugee crisis and the image of a dead child and, and when you've got a family huddled in the rubble and they talk to that family and they, the way they get you to listen is by finding the human story within the facts. And I think that's a direction journalism has really, really gone with in the last 10 years, more than ever before. Well, they have to support their colleagues, you see. <laughs> so they have to sell many newspapers or magazines. Selling, yes. <laughs> it's about selling news. I mean, I, I know that's true. But I do think it's the way to our hearts. We're all storytellers. Yes. And we want to listen to stories. It's such a basic instinct we have. And so if you do it that way, you get people to listen to what needs to be listened to. In an age of increasing automation and AI, are the creative arts more important than ever? There's a part of me that wants to just say, yes, yes, yes. I mean, yes, they are, but I don't want to put down our automated, incredible world and the direction it's going in. It's going in that direction. And to me, what's important is that we keep our eyes open as to the implications of that and try not to allow ourselves to be bulldozed into a way of being that we, we don't want and that is to our detriment. I see two threats if I pull back and look at the big picture. I think one is that theoretically, the more something is done for you by machines, the freer you are to have wonderful creative thoughts and pursue wildly imaginative projects. In reality, I think it can encourage a lazier response, that it's a bit like flexing a muscle. If you don't use that bit of your brain a lot, you'll be less inclined to use it. So we could slide into a less engaged, less creative way of being if we don't keep our eye on it. And the other thing I have a bit of a bugbear about is our algorithmic world. So an algorithm takes you down avenues that it's already picked up on. So our worlds aren't expanding, they're shrinking. And we don't know it because we think we're in a virtual world that is, we're exploring. But we're exploring and we're being guided in how we're exploring. So that's not real exploration. And it rules out the possibility of serendipity and random craziness, which are vital to the arts. So I have a little bit of a worry about that. And again, I think we have to keep our eye on it. I also worry just from the point of view of all these exciting distractions on the screen uh, and what that will do to reading. And already the time and inclination to pick up a book is being shrunk into a corner. Uh, and I've noticed that among, I mean, actually the students that I'm engaging with are readers. I love that. But um, yeah, it, that's an uphill battle. What was it like to be among the first cohort of female undergraduates at UNIF? Well, it was strange for a little bit. I mean, you couldn't help but feel a little like an exotic species of animal in a zoo. You know, there was sort of some staring going on these girls after hundreds of years. And actually, I also had a tricky tutor. I had a tutor who hadn't wanted women. He'd voted against them. Um, but I won him round with hard work. Um, and UNIF is a very, very, it still is this, it's not up itself, UNIF. It's a very welcoming college. And very quickly things settled down. And you learnt, I learnt, the value of friendship with girls, boys. It doesn't matter if you find a friend, they're a friend. And all those lessons that are invaluable. And lots of my friends now are from those UNIF days. Can you tell us more about 
your journey from writing on E.M. Forster to writing novels? Well, I had shown some creative urges as a child, okay? So I kept a diary, I, I liked, I remember writing a ghost story that was read out to the class and I thought, yes. So there were sort of signs that I might become a writer, I guess. But E.M. Forster's Howard's End was the first book that I fell in love with. I mean, I just loved that book in a way that hadn't happened to me before. And I was 15 when I read it. And the reason I loved it was because it told a page-turning emotional story that I could engage with. But at the same time, Forster is making you feel wiser about the world. He's full of insights as to what's going on in the story and why. And so to me, this was the first novel that just, it just did everything I ever wanted a book to do for me. It was like a friend, but it was, it entertained, but it taught me things. And so I always loved Forster. I went on to read all his novels. He was part of uh, what I wrote about during my study of 20th century literature when I was at uni. And then we were given the chance to do an optional thesis, which I think this is, I, actually, it's not optional anymore with the English course, but one of those things where if you do well, it counts towards your degree. And if you don't, it doesn't count against you. And I literally sat down one day when the deadline was about five days away and I just wrote this thing, 6,000 words, in one gulp. Wow. And everything I thought, and it was extraordinary, everything I thought about Forster just had, came out. And I think it had been building up, so it came out fully formed. Um, and I did well, I did well in that thesis and it was why I got a good degree. So I was very grateful for that. And I was also aware when I came to write my first, that story that became my first novel, that there was something Forsterian in my approach in that I had an authorial author's voice and I had my characters and I could pull back and um, hopefully do a little bit of the sort of thing he used to do where you offer some wisdom or a perspective, a slightly ironic take on what the character's doing. And I did that for my second novel as well. And then actually my third novel, I stopped doing that. I suppose I was finding my own voice. And I don't think anyone would say my first novel is Forsterian. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't sort of mimicking or anything. But now I liked my points of view, I like to be in the characters' heads. I'm, I'm like a character, you know, I'm, if you go into a room, you're seeing it through somebody's eyes. There's never the distance between the narrator and the characters. So I've sort of moved on from it. But I would still say that my, what I hope for with my novels is perhaps what Forster hoped for, which is that I'm providing entertainment, but also you get to the end of the book thinking you know a little bit more about how people function or what matters or doesn't matter. Mm. Yeah, so I'm trying to offer some insight as well. Okay, very, very interesting and uh, inspiring as well. well uh, thank, you. thank you very much for it's being been, with us. Voices from Oxford. Thank you for talking to me.